Hi, this is Scott Bradfield, and this is Reading Great Books in the Bathtub. We are at chapter 18, the final chapter of our book, our, our bathtub challenging book of Ulysses. And I will speak fairly briefly on the final chapter and then make a few final summations. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have anything particularly clever to say about Ulysses, um, except uh, the parts of it are really good and parts of it are really boring. But we'll try to talk about a, a bit about the overall effect of having read Ulysses in the bathtub without any supporting texts. So um, this is the final chapter. We've gone through, as, as the book progressed, as I've sort of warned you, it starts to get more monumental in Joyce's own imagination as he's writing it, and the chapters become much more complicated and clever, and they're too long, all of them. Uh, which, unfortunately, I think is the, the saddest part of this, is it prevents many of us, and it's, ha it's prevented me from doing this in the past, from enjoying the last chapter, which is one of the best chapters in the book. And... Uh, I think that by the time you get to it, I have in the past just been so frustrated, I kind of skimmed through it uh, just to pick up the main points. Uh, the closing pages of the final chapter in Ulysses are very beautiful and, sh and should be read aloud. I won't try to, I won't try to um, uh, make an exhibit of my poor dramatic talents by, by reading it out loud, but, we will, but you can read it to yourself and hear the rhythms and the beauty of the final pages when you read this book out loud to yourself, as mo much of this book should be read out loud to yourself in the bathtub. Um, so we've we've got the Penelope, it's, it's known as the Penelope scene, the uh, chapter, because Bloom has come home, he's come home with Stephen, he sent Stephen on his way in the previous chapter, and he's gone to bed telling Molly about this young man he's met, and Molly is, has, has two immediate reactions to Bloom's story, is A, uh, this guy's been out getting laid and and and, and uh, um, having sex with probably prostitutes. And that's what she thinks of her husband. And the second thing she thinks is, uh, I wouldn't mind uh, that Stephen guy. He sounds pretty handsome and he sounds like a good-looking young guy and he's a poet. So these two kind of strains start going through Molly uh, as she lies in bed beside Bloom. And at one point, I believe, gets up and goes to the toilet near the in the final chapter. And this is a long, this is a long, long, uh, twenty to twenty to thirty thousand word chapter, which is known as the stream of consciousness chapter, because it's almost all phrases. It's a series of phrases and narrative phrases uh, that emerge from Molly's thoughts. I want to say two or three things first. Nobody thinks like this. I mean, I, I certainly don't think like it, and I, I challenge anybody else to say they think in this coherent way. The, the chapter is quite coherent if you read it slowly. It is a series of associations in Molly's mind, but they do carry through and narrate her life with Bloom and her life sexually with other men. So she'll go through scenes of men she had sex with or men she almost had sex with, and she'll pretty much finish those scenes as then jump into another thought, into another stream. And their, um, their streaming effect, which is just kind of one phrase after another after another, then making a little shift into another chain of thought, is very well done, and to my mind completely disconnected from the way we think in a kind of polyglot mess, chunky memory, sometimes obsessive and repetitive thoughts that come through our heads uh, without the phraseology. And he's Joyce is thinking very seriously about this one sentence. So the last 25,000 words or 30,000 words of this book is one sentence that begins yes and ends yes. Now I'm going to read the first page and a half in my poor way and let you hear what you need to listen for, which is that we're very coherent, the streams are coherent, they start, they swell, they conclude, then a new one starts and swells and conclude. They aren't, they aren't chronologically sequential, they're not chronological phrases and narratives, but they do record the chronology of Molly's night lying in bed beside her husband who she's pretty sure just cheated on her 
And she has just finished having sex with Blazes that afternoon and is still filled with, with pleasure over this, this great uh, fuck she's had with Blazes Boiler. So let me just read the first page and a half so you can hear what you're listening for. Yes, because he never did a thing like that before, as asked to get his breakfast in bed with a couple of eggs since the City Arms Hotel, when he used to be pretending to be laid up with a sick voice doing his highness, to make himself interesting to that old faggot, Mrs. Reardon, that he thought he had a great leg of, and she never left us a farthing all for masses for herself, and her sole greatest miser ever was actually afraid to lay out four shillings for her methylated spirit, telling me all her ailments she had too much old chat in her about politics and earthquakes and the end of the world. Let us have a bit of fun. First God help the world if all the women were her sort." down on bathing suits and low necks. Of course, nobody wanted her to wear, I suppose. She was pious because no man would look at her twice. I hope I'll never be like her. A wonder she didn't want us to cover our faces, but she was a well-educated woman, certainly, and her gabby talk about Mr. Reardon here and Mr. Reardon there, I suppose he was glad to get shut of her and her dog smelling my fur and always edging to get up under my petticoats, especially then. Still, I like that in him, polite to old women. Like that. And waiters. And beggars, too. He's not proud out of nothing, but not always. If ever he got anything really serious the matter with him, it's much better for them to go into a hospital where everything is clean. But I suppose I'd have to drain it into him for a month. Yes. And then we'd have a hospital nurse next thing on the carpet. Have him staying there till they throw him out. Or a nun. Maybe like the smutty photo he has. She's as much a nun as I'm. So there's a, a good little clump. Molly is thinking as Bloom goes to sleep, he wants breakfast in bed. He's already, of course, Bloom's always fixing her breakfast in bed. What is what's gone into him? He seems to have had some big night. Bloom is excited, of course, because he's met Stephen and he's had a nice night with Stephen. He come, he's come home thinking he's made this kind of potential, kind of almost son, a, fa a, a fake son or a. a acquaintance who could be son-like figure in his life. And uh, he's happy about that, having met this intelligent man. And she takes it as far as sexual. Because for Molly, everything's sexual, particularly with men. All men think about is sex. So she thinks about that, and then she thinks about the connection between him speaking in a kind of happy voice with the way he used to talk to an old woman who looks like was their, their landlady in a house where they lived previously, um, the City Arms Hotel, and then we go into a long thing about the woman in the City Arms Hotel, Mrs. Reardon, and how she used to just go on and on about all this stuff, this old woman who's complaining about people in bathing suits and low necks and so forth. One of, one of the things that Molly will keep coming, through, coming to in this chapter is her fear of getting old and how women, when they become old and not attractive anymore, have almost no place in life at all in society. And they might as well be thrown out with the ashes, is what she says at one point. And this begins one of the thoughts in her head about all these old women wandering around. And then her affection for Poldy. Poldy is Leopold Bloom, her husband. And the fact that he's actually kind to people and kind to old women and kind to animals. So there's a, there's a whole series of little streams running through that passage, which we'll come back to, which will rise and come apart and go off in little... little, little uh, adjuncts, uh, flows, and then come back together. And the main, the main uh, focus, again, is her suspicions about her husband. She quite immediately starts talking about how he's always writing letters. and He doesn't want her to see him writing letters. You'll recall Martha, the letters he wrote as Henry Flowers to Martha. Those are probably those letters. And then we get into some pretty heavy uh, passages for that time as far as sexual... Uh, uh, Molly's sexual memories, which are pretty rich and pretty uh, pleasurable to her and encompass almost every possible sexual activity between a man and a woman in the course of these, these, these 20 to 30,000 words and the various men she's been to bed with. And she mentions on page 876, is worth looking out for is that there's a lot of thunder and a lot of noise outside just when uh, one of the times that blazes came she and Blazes came in bed, they heard all that thunder. That's about the same time that Bloom himself is masturbating on the beach to that girl, the, the, the girl with the limp, when the fireworks take off. 
So there's a kind of irony there that we have these two. The, 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 the sexual culmination in this marriage is by the husband and wife with two different people in two different places. The, ch the chapter goes on. You need to really read this out loud. You need to, it's worth reading out loud. I wouldn't cut any of this. This is the only chapter, uh, except for maybe the first few chapters, where I really wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to cut any of it. Because the continuity of this woman's voice and, the, and her, her, her selfishness and her affections are all so ample like her and so f uh, filled with life. And it's a very lively passage, which will be confusing and you won't recognize all the names. And there will be references to all these other characters. Um, she's, you know, there's a whole section about how uh, she's looking forward to having blazes boiling again. They're going to go on a trip. She likes to, she likes to be on trains because she gets to sit on a soft cushion and jump up and down. Um, there's, uh, th there's just lots of sexual jokes and sexual memories that go through here. At one point, the fact that her husband Leopold, the, the pole, who used to like to to a nurse on her breasts when she was when she was uh, when she was nursing her their daughter, um, and again every possible sexual encounter between men and women. Um, her her fears of getting old and what old women look like, and which women are looking older, quicker of her generation, and the different people who've been cheating on one another. Um, I don't want to go into any too much more of this. Except that she does get up and go to the bathroom at one point and is worried about her insides because she's had so much, I don't know if it's so much sex that she's been having um, or what's happening with her. And her memories of, of uh, Leopold and how they're not having really sex anymore, it becomes clear since the death of Rudy. And when their child died, something happened to them both. And that is dealt with pretty honestly and affectionately. She then about 9.22, 9.23 starts to go back to the thoughts of Stephen and his young, his lovely young cock 9.23 and thinking about Stephen as this potential um, lover. And it's not just that he's a young man, he's good looking. She starts to wonder if she's too old for him and decides she's not too old for him. Um, and then uh, she also likes the idea he's a poet. You know, and that he's got this artistic side to him because Molly definitely has a, an artistic side to her as well. Um, she starts talking about how women should really run the world. And then on page 931 to 933, we have this long, beautiful passage, which I encourage you to read out loud, in which Molly remembers a scene the first time she and Leopold kissed and made out on the hill in Houth, and uh, how she had a seed cake in her mouth, and she put the seeds in, from her mouth into his while they were kissing, which Bloom has also thought about and remembered. And that that is kind of this memory of, of uh, when she let him do what he wanted to do, uh, as, as this great positive closing, yes. So we just have this yes, yes, yes in her mind, which suggests that... that, that this homecoming between Bloom and his wife may be a positive thing, um, but there's no, there's no, um, nothing is assured by the end of this book. So anyway, it's a lovely passage. It's 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 challenging. It's not challenging like some of the others where there's just no narrative life in it. But you do have to follow through and read it pretty much at the pace you would read it out loud. You you, you can't skim this at all, and it's got a beautiful poetry to it. Just a beautiful thrilling continuous narrative poetry of Molly sitting there in the in the in middle of the night about two o'clock in the morning thinking about her life with with Leopold and it's got a lot of smut in it a lot of dirt a lot of a lot of sex so you might read read through it for that as well anyway I think it's a wonderful the ending is wonderful my closing thoughts are um, do I want to read Ulysses again and there's those passages that we were reading um, the last couple of weeks, from about the the takeoff, Bloom's masturbation scene on the beach, when we have that kind of takeoff on the romantic novel, and and the citizen chapter, which goes on and on about Gary Owen and the citizen, that up through there and up through the up through every chapter up till the final concluding chapter with Molly, 
I really think I don't, I've just had enough of this book. And I do wish those chapters were a lot shorter because I think there's, there's a wonderful book in here that, um, that, that Joyce really just was just too clever by half or more than half and, and, and was sort of, sort of lost. But when I reach the end and I see the greatest poetry in the book and there's great passages of poetry in the book, then I think maybe one day I will try it again in the bathtub. But it's you can't. I, I I always come up against hard against these really long middle mid mid to late chapters in the book. Okay, so it's it's uh, it's definitely you have to read it someday. You should definitely read it in the bathtub. Don't read it for school because they'll spend forever talking about uh, you know, the English occupation of Ireland and um, you know the the the, the gender uh, the the. Uh, the gender battles in, in Irish politics and, and so forth, and they really kind of walk you away from just these, this human life in the book, which is really powerful, particularly that last chapter and some of those early chapters. And that's all i got to say. So I think the next few books we're going to read are going to be a lot shorter than Ulysses, and uh, hope you have a good uh, good reading experience with Ulysses. I know this is a very kind of halting and very... Um, unprofessional lecture series of lectures i just wanted to talk totally honestly as i'm reading the book and talk to people about a book that is really worth reading like a human being and not as a university student okay good luck